Damn, that Dr. Tomorrow version is doing like 50 bucks on eBay. You ever worry that you're going to start recording and you got like a big booger hanging out of your nose? <laughs> Do I have a big booger hanging out of my nose? No. What's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Some Men's Comics. And this, of course, is... The Bolo Show. That's right. We are covering new comic book day releases. This is recorded Wednesday night, new comic book day. It's premiering to you right now, Thursday at 9 p.m. To those watching during the premiere, watching on the replay, or even listening to the audio version, I would say this is probably the first week that you can really say comic books are back. Absolutely. And I like what you said, Brian. This is Wednesday, new comic book day. You hear that, DC Comics? Wednesday is new comic book day. Yeah, so if you're first time watching this, we cover the new comic book daily. So we break them down into first appearances. We break it down into reader buzz books, variant buzz books, and then we have a long-term play at the end. The list comes out every late Tuesday, Wednesday morning. It's on Instagram, as well as that full article version over there on simplemanscomics.com, right, Jack? Absolutely. That is usually the very first place you can see it. So head over to simplementscomics.com. Check out the bowl list, the full article with links to all the various books that are coming out for new comic book day. With that being said, we're going to get into it right now, starting with first appearances. A fairly short first appearance list, which I'm fine with that for right now. But the, what we're going to talk about is that Red Hood Outlaws number 46 that gave us the first appearance of Bizarro's mommy. <laughs> you know, one of those fun appearances, I like the Red Hood and the Outlaws book. Um, I, I, I kind of always have. It's uh, one of those kind of like offshoot fun reads, but I don't think this is a really uh, uh, investable character. We haven't seen Bizarro take off per se. So to, to expect to see Bizarro's mom, I, I wouldn't expect much out of that. But, you know, in a light week with uh, a lot of great releases, Definitely a big list, but one that uh, was a little lighter on the first appearances, except for one major one. So, you know, I think Bizarro's mom just, just kind of ekes onto the list this week. But if it's Bizarro's mom, wouldn't it really be Bizarro's dad if, in Bizarro World? <laughs> I, I can't even touch that <laughs> these days. <laughs> but yeah, we had one other one, but we're saving that. We'll get into that one a little bit later. So we're going to move right on over into that reader buzz section. First book we're going to pick up on the Reader Buzz section. This had heavy Reader Buzz. It's had heavy Reader Buzz. Talking about a bunch of first appearances. Talking about that 1 in 25 designer variant. But we are also talking Batman number 93. Starting to get into that Joker war. Yeah, I mean, this series is heating up. And James Tenyon is on an absolute run. I think we're going to see Batman show up in the Reader Buzz for the next several releases. I, mean, I would imagine all the way up through issue number 100 which is a big deal because there was a long, long period of time where Batman was not showing up on this list and was more likely to show up on this list if there was an uh, extra attractive cover B that kind of got the market's attention. So it, it's, it's really great. I think it's the most organic and cool thing when comics are buzzing because of the reader buzz, um, when it means that you know collectors are enjoying the stories, comic readers are enjoying the stories, and at the same point, they're enjoying it so much that they want to collect and preserve and save. And that also gets the attention of those other offshoot groups like the speculators and the flippers and the resellers and whatnot. Yeah, and if you're probably one of the few out there that aren't reading Batman right now, you definitely should pick it up. It's been great. This one was great because it was kind of like a high story, but there was some stuff in there. There's a couple characters that we are left wondering what the fate of those characters are. And I think people that were heavy on the designer I wouldn't say disappointed, but you find out that character isn't really what it seemed. And I'm not going to give too much away from that spoiler. So I hope too many people didn't spend too much money on that 1 in 25 designer variant they had. But great issue, and I continue to pick that up for sure. But sticking with Batman, we're going over to that Batman Smile Killer, that DC Black Label. This is by Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino. So if you're a fan of like Gideon Falls, this is that same creative team. Of course, people are familiar with them either way. I haven't had a chance to read this yet, but I did pick it up. 
Yeah, I think this is one a lot of people slept on. Um, it, you know, the bolo list is made up of social media buzz, and we're still kind of getting back into the groove of New Comic Book Day. So, you know, there's still books that aren't really being talked about. We're seeing a lot of discussion about the same books over and over again. So on this list, there were several books that were just heavily talked about for the last several weeks. But then this was one of those books where it kind of flew under the radar and people started to notice that it was selling out places. And it's no surprise with the creative team, like you mentioned, and the heat around kind of all things Batman related with the Batman movie and news of uh, Flashpoint Batman possibly being the next Flash movie and Batman Beyond coming to the HBO Max uh, streaming service, as well as um, you know, everything that's going on with the Tinian series that we just talked about. So, um, it's definitely a good time for Batman books and Jeff Lemire that there's a certain level of consistency that you expect. And it's always good when you have a creative team working together who have worked together in the past and you kind of have that continuity between the two of them. Yeah, and speaking of Batman Beyond, if you guys aren't reading that, that's still a great series. We haven't talked about it much. It hasn't gone to that reader buzz since pretty much what the Batwoman Beyond stuff ha that happened. But if you're a fan of that Batman Beyond, the, the latest arc, the latest run has definitely been a good read. And I pick it up. I'm a, I'm a few issues behind, but I always go back and catch up when I, when I get the chance. But moving on to the next book, we're going over to Image, and we're talking about that Texas Blood number one. This is one I was really excited about. We talked about this on our last call show, and it did not disappoint. It kind of solicited it as like a No Country for Old Men style, and that's exactly how it came out to be. I just pictured this as a, a Coen Brothers type movie, um, and it makes a casserole dish the main character, I would say, during that first issue. It's, it's one of those books where I definitely think it has some potential for like an option. But um, I also think it is the benefit of the fact that there hasn't been a, like a big image number one release in a while. So I think people are looking for that. Boom has kind of come out the gate um, coming back from the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it's taken a second for a lot of publishers to kind of get their ground going. A lot of, a lot of in new series like this one, they're kind of on hold. They're probably supposed to come out a while ago. Um, and, it, you know, the whole schedule got shifted but at the same point um you know i think this one benefits from that it, there was a lot of attention on it this week and, and it's great that there's been so much positive response and reader buzz from it because um you know it's if you're going to get that kind of attention you want to be able to deliver on it so i'll be interested to see going into like issue number two brad how many people kind of share your sentiment and are still on board yeah, and it's crazy because if you really wanted to say it, you, not too much happened during the first issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy wakes up, he's 70, he's like the sheriff, and <laughs> wife's telling him, for your birthday, I want to make a casserole. Make sure you pick up the casserole dish. And uh, he goes get, to look for the casserole dish and then comes up on the, some bad situation. But uh, definitely kicks off well, but without too much going on, but definitely makes you want issue number two. And... I say it like that because I don't want to give away spoilers. But if you you guys watching right now, if you read that Texas Blood number one, let us know what you thought of it as well because I thoroughly enjoyed it for sure. But going from an old Texas town out into that galaxy far, far away, we get that Star Wars Adventures Clone Wars Battle Tales number two. Say that three times fast. But it seems like the buzz has kind of died down just a little bit on this, but still worth picking up. Well, you don't have, you know, the exclusives like the hot Frankie's comics, uh, Peach Momoko, Yoda exclusive. You don't have the one in 100 variant that seemed to get everybody's attention. So this is going to happen. This is natural. You do still have the one in 10 variant, though, although it's like the same cover. You do have the one in 10 variant. And I've said before that um, I actually believe in this entire series as a set. You have five issues. Um, I think the one in 10 incentives for the whole set are going to be great. And while there isn't immediate buzz on this, We've talked about these properties with IBW. Um, the reality being that most likely because of the lack of store variants for issue number two, you're not going to see as many incentives in the marketplace. And not seeing as many incentives in the marketplace means they will dry up faster than they typically would uh, in issue number one. So I think that's going to be the trend for issues number three, four, and so on. Although we do see a return to an exclusive with Frankie's Comics with issue number three with that awesome Peach Momoko Darth Maul cover. Right. And then that Star Wars Adventures number 32, they have the, the Peach Momoko Ray for that. And if you need to be in Frankie's group, because he's actually doing a lottery within the group, 
for people to purchase that. But the next one we're talking about also had some store exclusives for it. We're getting over to that Stephen King based comic book, right? It's based on the novel by Stephen King and his son. And we're talking about Sleeping Beauties number one. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you're not talking about uh, Joe Hill here. We're, talk we're talking about uh, Owen King. And, uh, you, you know, this, this is one of those things where uh, we talked about this one pre FOC. It, it had that one in 25 incentive, one in 10. Uh, incentive. I think the one in ten is better looking than the one in twenty five, but the one in twenty five, being uh, the more limited book, definitely one to keep an eye out for. And people were buzzing on this one. This one got variant buzz. It's got retailer exclusive buzz. It had reader buzz. It was kind of hitting on all cylinders. And I think at this point, there's with the horror renaissance that's kind of going on right now, and people really we've been talking about this for like a year, right? The horror's hot, and uh, especially with reader buzz. I think names like Stephen King are just going to, you know, continue to ring out. Uh, and, and the comic community has embraced uh, these sort of literary properties and, and bringing them in and getting them in uh, kind of sequential art form. Yeah, I think it, you know, it doesn't hurt it for the fact that the outsider that was just on HBO kind of brought back Stephen King's name to a lot of people that kind of were like, yeah, that's a guy who did all that great horror stuff in the 80s and 90s, but Outsider was a fantastic show. If you haven't watched that, definitely check it out on HBO or wherever you can find it by chance. But either way, I haven't had a chance to read this one yet, but I do have it in my pool. Next, we're going to talk about on Reader Buzz. I know this is one that Jack was glad to see put on the list and glad to garner some buzz. And we're talking about Spider Ham number five. Yeah, and I think this one is largely due to the cover, um, getting that kind of first appearance of Hobgoblin, um, uh, homage that, that would, I think it's ASM 238. Uh, you know, that's a popular cover and every time- It's been swiped a few times, right? Yeah, every time you've seen that homage done, that the store selling it usually does pretty well. So uh, I, I'm not surprised, but, and then you saw kind of a trickle down where even the cover B, it was like sold out a lot of places. So Spider-Ham is a cult popular character, certainly not a big print run. Um, I think that the the next generation of comic fans, these kids growing up with Into the Spider-Verse as a major part of their childhood, are going to look at Spider-Ham far different than the people who um, kind of grew up on the original comic series. So I'm kind of bullish on this character, and I think that this this little mini series that, that Marvel recently put could be a sleeper. I know that sounds kind of silly, but you just never know. Yeah, he definitely had a good role in um, the first Spider-Verse movie. I know my kids enjoyed him. Like, I picture him as, like, the Spider-Man version of Scrappy-Doo, but Spider-Verse movie definitely made my kids a fan. And what do you think the print run on these by chance are? I haven't been paying attention, but I'd say, what, sub-20,000? Yeah, I mean, issue number one was probably higher because they had, like, the one in 50 incentive um, place to it. But by now, sitting at issue number five, I would imagine, yeah, sub. Yeah, I'm thinking like 17 to 20 or something like that. Right, right. For Marvel, that's pretty low, but. Right. So then when people get onto a cover like this because they think it's attractive and they grab it for their PC, I think just think that's going to make a book like this a tough five. Yeah. So this set one through five, though, I mean, that's something to keep an eye out for because there's just not a ton of Peter Porker books to really collect out there. There's a few variants. There's the first appearance. Um, and then beyond that, that's it. So this this one through five miniseries may be a long-term play. And I'd rather pick up that than slapstick. But so speaking of low print runs, the next one we're talking about in the reader buzz coming over to Omni Press is that Rick and Morty Council of Ricks number one. Yeah, I got yelled at last time we didn't have a Rick and Morty number one on. Boy, the Rick and Morty faithful came out, those uh, Dan Harmonites. Um, next thing I know, I was getting lit up with messages that I missed out on Rick and Morty. And I try to tell people, if a book's not on the bowl list, I didn't miss out. You guys missed out. You didn't let me know. You didn't talk about it. And you guys made sure to let me know about this one. Um, both covers sold out. It's interesting, Brian, because Omni Press stopped the ongoing series. They ended the ongoing series. But they've continued to come out with these series of one-shots, but they're continuing to sell well. So part of me wants to say, what were you thinking ending the ongoing? And part of me wants to say, well, you know what? This is working for you too. So who the hell am I to judge? Um, I don't know, but you really cannot doubt the Rick and Morty faithful, which is why I think Rick and Morty is overlooked, uh, especially by those from like our generation who it's not the cartoon we grew up on, 
but I think it's overlooked in the kind of grand scheme of successful cartoon properties within the comics world and maybe the goat, but it, you know, we certainly talked about it in our top 10 list of uh, comics based on cartoons out of that special video we got right here on some of these comics YouTube channel. Yeah. It's funny. I always tend to either get or like the, the opposite of stuff that is popular. <laughs> Transformers were popular in the 80s. I had GoBots. We'll have people like Rick and Morty. I like Clarence. Clarence is my favorite cartoon. My kids right now are watching Adventure Time. They're hooked on that, watching it on Hulu. But I definitely get the appeal, and I know people are like ravenous over Rick and Morty and definitely pick those up. And like you said, we've seen it time and time again where some of those books catch fire. But that's going to wrap up the Reader Buzz section for us this week. So we're going to move right on now into the Variant Buzz. And it seems like we can't go a week on this list without saying that name, but we're going to do it right now. We're talking about that Jenica number three, Peach Momoko, one in 10 variant. Oh, you're talking about Jenica. We can't go a week without saying Jenica. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I know what you're talking about. You're talking I said about- Joe Montaigne. <laughs> you're talking about Peach Momoko, of course. And you know what? Like, I'm going to sit here, man, and I'm going to- Hot is hot. I'll I'm going to tell that. you, man, let the hate rain in because it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, the funniest thing is I don't even really love this cover because I don't like the skinny turtles. Uh, this is going to sound weird, especially talking about a female turtle, but I like my turtles a little thicker when, they, when, the, when, uh, when they're kind of depicted um, on, a, on a cover. She but looks it, like she's lost on the cover. But <laughs> yeah, that, going, What's going on? So this isn't one of my favorite ones, but it's, it's an example of, I think, that Peach being so popular. People want to see her play in whatever their favorite world is, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're a Turtles fan, you've been dying for a Peach Turtles, um, the same way Star Wars fans went nuts for Peach Star Wars. Um, and I think that that's going to consistently play out. I want to see who's going to be the ballsy store, who's going to do like the Peach Transformers cover or something like that, because I just think you're going to see the same thing. This cover is a one in 10 incentive, and there were stores that did retailer exclusives. There was even an exclusive done of the Virgin cover making a virgin version of that. And usually we've talked about how that kills the trade dress. Funny things are going on in the market right now, though, right? That virgin cover is selling on eBay for $29.99, which is, I guess, reasonable for a, a uh, virgin retailer exclusive variant. But the 1 in 10 variant itself is selling for $29.99. It's the same price, um, three times uh, ratio on a book that I really thought was going to be just oversaturated because people had seen it, um, stores had created exclusives in my opinion why unless you had done jenica one and two if you were just jumping in on jenica three you did it just to get a stack of those peach momoko um variants but it didn't damage the market and that is a testament to how hot she is as an artist yeah i agree and and you know you know what a cover or titles that I would like to see her do covers on is the like the Agents of Atlas and those characters like Swordmaster, Arrow. I think it would lend to the style. Um, I think she excels. We've had this discussion before. I think she excels at female characters on covers. I think some of those covers would be perfect. And they'd probably increase the sales on some of those titles as well. Yeah, and b- but my favorite thing going with her right now is the diversity. It's kind of crazy that she has done the tiniest of small press indie publishers to the biggest of the big two to iconic characters. I don't know when she oh, sleeps right now because it seems like. <laughs> oh man, I tell you, like she must be <laughs> something like this. Right, right, right. It's a scandal waiting to happen because she's got all her kids painting them with her, but you can't. <laughs> Because you can't figure out like how she gets so many done. And I think that's another thing is a testament to the hustle. And we talked about it as well, um, you know, kind of like privately within our kind of group chat uh, about like how professional she is and how every retailer that works with her always says the same thing that like she gets back to them quickly. She's very willing to do whatever a retailer is kind of looking for. And then again, her willingness to work with so many publishers and that's, this isn't the last time we're going to talk about her on this list this week. Nope, not at all. And I don't like all her covers, but like I said, you got to respect it. And no doubt she's doing, she's, doing her, she's doing her thing. So definitely respect that and kudos to her. But the next one we'll talk about on that variant buzz section, this one's from Vault. We haven't talked about Vault for a while. And we're talking about that Bleed Them Dry number one. They switched from those like homage variants over to this pulp and paint variant, and it seemed to do well. 
Yeah, it was a late breaker, though, because the book itself didn't seem to carry the buzz that some previous Vault releases had. Um, we had actually kind of kicked around the idea of Vault being on the uh, downside of three up, three down, but literally this book right here saved it. This book being sold out everywhere the night before New Comic Book Day really made us look at it and go, okay. Okay, you know, they might be down, but they still got a puncher's chance. And uh, it, I got to give the team, the, the tip of uh, Tim Daniel and uh, Nathan Good and the creative mind behind these variant programs, it really unique. What Vault has done with the Vault Vintage and then going into these pulp books. And let me also say the, the, the balls that it takes to have a very successful variant program and to you stop. Shift it. Yeah, kind of, and kind of before people get tired of it, you change it. Um, I feel like they might have done it too early because I love the Vault Vintage line, but uh, I got to give them credit. The Wassel Brothers, I think they've, they've made those kinds of good decisions. So, um, you know, I, I think that this was a great, uh, a great move for them. And I'm glad to see this book was popular. It'll be interesting to see if these pain pulp books continue to be this kind of popular. Right. And the next one we're talking about is Dr. Tomorrow number three. And I don't remember who, who did this one. Here. Who did this one, Jack? Well, this is, of course, Peach Momoko. And again, with another publisher with Valiant Comics. Um, this book, I think, is a, a good long-term one because I, I think that this one got overlooked compared to some other uh, of Peach's releases. It's selling right now for cover price. It's drying up. There was, there was a last... Retailers were prepared, right? Retailers knew um, to, to have this book. Um, but it's still vault. Uh, excuse me, Valiant uh, publishing numbers are tiny, um, especially right now. Valiant could not be colder. So this comes at a time where uh, even if it's inflated because of peach numbers, I still think this is a good long-term one. And a good indicator of the possibilities for this book is what the frankiescomics.com exclusive virgin cover of this book is doing. The book, that book was released at a price of $20.00. Um, I think the current run was about a thousand. I think with damages, it ended up being about seven hundred. Um, but it's selling right now for about forty-five to fifty. So that shows you that people are on this book and they're all over it. But I also got to say that's another reason why you guys need to sign up for those bolo boxes at the Simple Vince Comics uh, Patreon uh, page because we only have one left, just one left right now. And then our bolo boxes are completely sold out. And then we have another plan for phase two of the bolo boxes. But I got to tell you, those prices are going to go up. And in July, we know we will have this Peach Momoko Dr. Tomorrow book. So, you know, you got another shot. If you missed it, sold out uh, through frankiescomics.com. Yeah, when he says one left, he's not talking about one box. We're talking about one spot within the Patreon where you get that monthly box, which gets you two, two Frankie's exclusives. And we got some other stuff coming up for those boxes with news to follow later. So one spot left, and then we might make them available and another avenue, but of course they will be a little bit more expensive yeah. at that time. So, so thank you to all those that have signed up for the Patreon. Thank you for supporting the channel. And we hope we can provide buy you back to you through those boxes as well. Yeah, so that's one spot left grandfathered in at that original price. But moving into the next one on the variant list, this is one, we're talking Green Lantern 80th, right? This is another one that had those decades variants. I gotta be honest, I, Kind of like the decades, but I actually liked the cover A, Liam Sharp cover the best out of these this, on this one. And I'm a big Green Lantern fan. I did as well. Um, I'm a huge Green Lantern fan as well, but this one didn't have quite the bang for the buck, I felt like, with the selection of covers. Um, and see, and then the, the Green Lantern fan in me kind of gets mad because I'm like, why are you doing my guy wrong? Yeah. Uh, you know, you had Gabriel Delato and Matina and all of these names. Um, come out the woodwork for some of these other books and I don't feel like they put the same yeah uh, into this one it. had some good talent but like even like the David Finch cover wasn't like a David Finch cover to, that I'm used to yeah and it and like I, the 70 Neil Adams cover wasn't it just I don't know yeah it didn't hit like they normally do and I understand using Neil well Neil Adams I mean he hasn't done a more modern cover that's done well in a while but um you know you got to use him because he's iconic with Gre with Green Lantern um, and Finch isn't typically the artist I would think of with Green no, you're Lantern. like Moon Knight and Conan, right? Yeah, and X Men. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, so it, it's one of those things. I would have liked to have seen some of the more realistic stylized, because you're talking about a cosmic character. Um, artists kind of work with Green Lantern. But either way, I agree with you. I think the Liam Sharp cover hits hard. Uh, that's kind of the one to go to for me. But then moving on into the next one, we're going over to Boom with some ending again. We're talking about that Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 50. This is that, what, 1 in 100 in Hyakuli? 1 in 100 and 1 in 50 in Hyakuli. We have two. The 1 in 50 has the trade dress. The uh, 1 in 100 is a Is the one that's color. going nuclear? Yes. Um, and the thing is, we haven't seen these kind of high ratio uh, – uh, books within Power Rangers. That's kind of been a uh, newer uh, thing, and it kind of kicks off really with this issue. And this is the first time Ingyuk Lee's gotten on board with Power Rangers, and I kind of think this is a marriage made in heaven. Um, you're seeing incredible prices being paid right now um, for these books. The pre-sales on these were extremely, extremely strong, um, and now you're seeing you know over ratio prices being paid all over the place for both the one in 50 as well as the uh, one in 100. And I think that's only going to continue. And we've got word that Inhyuk is going to continue to work on the Power Ranger line. So I think there could be some other future high ratio uh, stuff coming uh, in the works from Inhyuk Lee and Boom Studios. So that's something to pay attention to. But we've talked about Peach Momoko, Brian, and the two books that she had on the list. But Inhyuk Lee had a week this week. Oh, yeah. We're about to get into it. <laughs> but the next one is in Hackley also, and we're talking about that Immortal Hulk number 34 zombie variant. We haven't heard too much Immortal Hulk talk lately, but this cover is amazing. Yeah, the reader buzz on the series had been down. Um, I think it's kind of reignited with some of the one-shots that were announced, the tie-ins like the Immortal She-Hulk, yeah. as well as the announcement that the series is going to end at issue 50, and the announcement um, that there is already kind of a work in the art. Uh, it's already kind of like some uh, some some workings going on with the current MCU Hulk that they've already kind of like given the hint that he's immortal. So there's kind of a lot of reignited uh, speculation surrounding the character. And it, it didn't necessarily carry over in this issue into reader buzz, but we did see this cover sell out. And these program variants are certainly variants that a lot of retailers are sick of. I don't blame them. Um, they, you know, it, it, they haven't worked for a number of years, and I think Marvel kind of needs to retool how they do these cover beats. But because of that, sometimes they get kind of overlooked without really checking out the art, or the art isn't released before you're putting that order in for FOC. And this Inhyuk Lee art is kind of amazing, and I think that it's kind of a perfect storm, which is why you're seeing sellouts all over the place. Yeah, and you're right. Like we've talked before, like the reader buzz kind of died down on this book. We've also talked about that horror renaissance. I think this book kind of tied into bringing attention back to yeah. horror comics because when it came out we've talked about before i picked it up mainly just for the alex ross covers because i like the covers on that started reading it and i was like wow this book's really good and this is one of those books that we talked about was built on reader buzz that gained that popularity and people started picking it up but some storyline changes some people didn't agree with that direction that it went and it kind of died down a little bit but like you said that buzz is starting to garner back up the next one we're talking about on the variant buzz list is Batgirl number 46. By which artist? Of course, in Hyuk Lee. Now, this one had a little bit of reader buzz, too. Almost made that portion of the list. But this in Hyuk Lee cover B was certainly the one to be on the lookout for. It's the one everybody was talking about. Um, and I am not surprised at all. Great cover. Uh, again, these cover Bs, people see them coming. Uh, especially when the great cover art. And I will say credit to DC Comics. They do do a better job than Marvel of getting the cover art out to the retailers prior to FOC, allowing them to make an actual action. They just ship them all missed selection. Up. Yeah. And, and it's just tough because, um, you know, because of that, retailers see these great covers coming. They know that these people are going to want these covers. So we've yet to have the demand yeah, kind of They're not going to get Batgirl again like they were with Middleton, damn it. Right. So you're not seeing the, the supply um, be short in comparison to the demand. But Brian, you and I are two stubborn oxes who still are bullish on the long-term value of a lot of these DC cover bees. And then I think a lot of these are going to come back. 
Well, and I, I even doubled down on that with the beginning of the rebirth run with the cover Bs, because I think a lot of people, especially LCS, you talk to them, they were ordering more of the cover A's, not so much the cover Bs. And then that popularity started building and then started seeing the more of that cover artwork. So they ordered more of those cover Bs. But remember when rebirth first launched, each title kind of had like a big name artist, like Neil Adams, I think, was doing Green Arrow. Art Germ was doing one, Matina, and then they kind of switched. And then, of course, Frank Cho was doing Wonder Woman, and they kind of knocked him off of that for some dumbass reasons. But either way, I still think those earlier Rebirth cover Bs are definitely lower printed than what you see right now for sure. But off the soapbox, that ends the variant buzz section for this week. And we're going to get into Jack's long-term play. And it's the one book that we haven't talked about that you guys have probably been putting in the chat the live chat right now talking about it talking about the character and no doubt i've seen that conversation we're recording this we're watching the live chat with you so we're probably talking about it but we're talking about what thor number five of and course we get black winter the first full appearance or so they say of black winter of course there was kind of like a cameo in issue four um but now you get kind of the first full in body appearance um in issue five and this was something certainly uh, we were kind of tipped off to the fact that this was going to be a huge issue. And uh, it definitely is. And th this was a slam dunk choice this week, right? Because, you know, Thor may not be, whether people want to hear this or not, like an A character in, in, in publishing. When I mean people want to hear this, I mean my man Brian. But, you know. Oh, that's part of the reason why I like him. I feel like right. I got a little niche. My, remember when we were talking about Donny Cates taking over? I was like yep. selfish, you know, like that, the indie music that you like and now everyone's going to listen to him wow that's how i felt about thor but no doubt love jason aaron's run but i definitely have been impressed with donny cates as well right so when donny jumps on suddenly he it becomes a level attention right so this this series and venom no no marvel series gets more eyeballs on it and a character creation with, by Donny Cates, it's just something you can't sneeze at at this point, right? I mean, we see characters created, we see first appearances every week, we have an entire section of it. And honestly, if you watch us on a week-to-week -week basis, both Brian and I are kind of skeptical of nine out of 10 first appearances that hit the market. Yeah, we um, talked about it on what, three up, three down, it's like people go after first appearances like Cookie Monster. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah, or, you know, or it's 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 a Pokemon thing. They gotta collect them all, and then it's one of those things where uh, you can get exhausted with that. And yes, we've been doing this for a long time, so sometimes we can get jaded. But also, there's a level of experience that comes in, and chasing every first appearance on a weekly basis certainly isn't the wisest thing. It can also cost you a lot of money, and your money can be better served putting into back issues. But when you see a trend, like clearly we see with Donny Cates, where he has a command over the market, um, I can say, well, I'm a Donny Cates fan. You can say you're a Donny Cates fan, but it's like, yeah, no shit. Everybody's a Donny Cates fan at this point. That's kind of the way that goes. And because of that, um, I think you, you cannot sleep on any first appearance coming out of these series. And you look at his level of importance within Marvel. I firmly believe that Marvel and the MCU, they are going to use a lot of what Donnie has written over the last few years in the future of the MCU. I think we're going to see no. Um, I think we'll, I think we will see, um, you know, we'll see kind of like everything that's played out with the Venom series play out. Uh, I think that certainly they can bring Dylan into the fold. There's a lot they can do. Um, and I think that creating a character within this Thor world um, that can be a character for the future and one that we've already seen kind of people get excited for. Uh, they, you know, we talk, we've talked about Peach Momoko and we've talked about Frankie's comics that they've got that Peach Momoko um, number six, Thor number six variant with Black Winter right on the cover. And we saw the popularity of that. So that kind of tips you off right there. Like people want this character. And then look what the book's doing immediately. It's, it's, it's pretty rare that we're talking about a long-term play that's already spiking because we try to give you books that we feel like you can get in on a cover price. But like I said, I'd be remiss to ignore this book. And it's already selling for $15 to $18. I do expect it to honestly drop a little bit, Brian, because I think like everything else, attention will go somewhere else next week or the week after. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I kind of expect almost everything does. 
But this is a good long-term play. I got to believe. Donnie Cates writes these scripts, like long-term kind of outlines of what he's looking to do. I promise you there is a long-term play in this. I really don't believe this is a designer situation. I could be wrong. Uh, it could be designer. could be vigil. Uh, both great written characters, but not investable characters. Um, but I don't believe that about Black Winter. So that's why this is my long-term play of the week this week. Yeah. Um, this book, no doubt, you can say long-term play, but I'd say it's also my my reader pick of the week. I do it some of them. But and I, I, maybe there's a little bit of bias because I'm a big Thor fan. But this book is, if you were a fan of like the whole God Butcher arc and all that, this is Donny Cates has been doing the same thing. And this issue was just fantastic. I don't want to give spoilers away, but it brings back a lot of other villains. And then there's a thing at the end where you're like, holy crap, between Black Winter and Galactus that just like, yeah, bring on the next issue because I'm ready to read it right now. And that's what comics is about. That's what, you know, that excitement you get reading an issue. You read some issues like, yeah, that was pretty good. Go on to the next one. Thor wasn't that way. It was just like that mm -hmm. holy fudge moment. And I just want issue number six right now. And on top of it, we talk, we're talking about how great this issue is and all the reasons why we kind of believe in it and how, how great the reader buzz is. We didn't even mention the fact that it had two variants that got a lot of people's attention with um, the zombie variant by uh, Jung Young Yoon, as well as um, Rasad Ribic one in 25 variant. So, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, this kind of book hit on all cylinders this week. Yeah, if you guys have picked it up, let us know what you thought. I mean, I definitely enjoyed it. I'm sure a lot of you guys did as well. Outside of the first appearance, we're, we're well aware of that. But what do you think of Donnie Kate's Thor run so far? I think a lot of people are enjoying it. I'm, I won't say pleasantly surprised because I, I figured he'd do well, but I am a Jason Aaron homer. So I was holding on to it, and, and I'm glad the way it went. But great long-term play. And, again, that wraps up the bolo list for this week, right, Jack? Yeah, that, that's the end of the list. Again, this is the list that's made by you guys, what you guys are talking about on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Make sure you're tagging at aka underscore Mr. Dot Bolo, as well as at Simplements Comics, and let us know what you're looking at for next week's new comic book day, and we'll be sure to include it on next week's Bolo list. So we might be done talking about new comic book day, but we're not done talking about comic books this week. Tune in tomorrow 9 p.m. Eastern, where we're going to talk about those books that are hitting final order cutoff this coming Monday night. I want to get those in, get those orders in, guarantee your copy. We're talking about books that are three weeks prior to release. This is the last chance to get those orders in, right? That's right. So don't be reacting and going on New Comic Book Day trying to catch up to some book you see on the Bolo list. Make sure you've got those pre orders in on FOC day and before so that you can get the lowest possible price and you're locked in with your copies in advance. Right, that'll premiere tomorrow night, 9 p.m., but will be available on replay. And like everything else, the audio version will be available on the podcast. And here's a little secret about some of these audio versions, guys. Sometimes the audio versions of these shows are available hours before the video is. So definitely want to check out that Simple Men's Comments podcast wherever your podcasts are found. And with that being said, guys, this is Brian Jack with Simple Men's Comics. See you guys in the next video.